Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably got a big box of pole floats like this at home, or you've seen rows and rows of them in a local shop. Do you know how to use them properly and what to do with them? In this video, we're going to look at float stems, float bristles, float bodies. Let's get straight into it. So typically the most common float bristle is a plastic bristle, which you can see on these three here. And you can get both a solid plastic bristle and a hollow plastic bristle. As you can see, this is a hollow plastic bristle, and which means obviously it's, uh, there's air inside of it. And what, what these are great for is visibility. It almost seems to absorb sunlight, the plastic bristles, and they really glow whenever there's a bit of sun out. Um, so if you've got any difficult light conditions, plastic is definitely the one to go for. I'm going to talk more about the difference between solid and hollow plastic a bit later. Uh, there's, there's a couple of other materials as well. Um, that, for example, is a fiberglass bristle. It's a lot thinner. You can also get wire and you can get cane as well. I wouldn't really bother with those unless you're doing really specific kinds of fishing such as you know really delicate canal fishing, bloodworm, stuff like that. I sometimes use cane for a few things but generally you know 95% of the time you're looking at plastic. So the diameter of your float bristle is going to be determined mainly by what size fish you're targeting but also what baits you're using and what time of year and I actually keep this very simple actually I only use probably three or four diameters actually for most of my my still water fishing and the, the first one is the one I use almost exclusively for carp and that's a two mil hollow tip there and I use that all year round for carp, so uh, even in the depths of winter. But what I do is I simply alter how much I have showing. So in summer, you're typically going to have that much or even maybe that much for pellets. In winter time, you can alter that to a tiny little blob like so. And uh, that's simply because bites are going to be a lot more finicky and it's just going to be obviously little little bobs and things on the float, little flickers and things, even with big carp. I don't like using fine bristles for carp because you have to dot them down and if they're too fine a bristle, it's going to be too sensitive. You're going to foul up fish. So uh, that's I also use that sometimes if it's really warm for F1s. But that's typically my carp bristle. Um, if you're fishing big baits like worms as well, if you're perhaps you're in a river or a, a drain or something, or you're going for perch, then you're going to use a, a thick bristle as well. Um, simply because a, a big bait like a, a lobworm tail or something like that's going to take a small bristle under if it's dragging bottom. The next bristle down I use is this one which is about 1.5 mil. So I'd say this bristle um, bristle class is about 1.5 to 1.7 mil. And that's the class I use for F1s and perhaps fish such as skimmer bream. So it's slightly scaled down from the 2 mil, but it's still fairly thick. Um, so I'll use this for pellets, things like that, corn, all year round really. Again, I'll dot, dot it right down in winter and have a little bit more showing in summer. But that's that's just a medium-sized bristle. Um, you can also use that for maggot fishing for silvers, maybe, and it's warmer. Again, maybe a, sort of scaled up for silvers. But if you're going to be fishing for silverfish, then this my third fish bristle choice is a 1.2 mil. So that's my choice for silverfish. Now interestingly, these two bristle types are both hollow plastic because hollow's a lot more buoyant, slightly more visible than solid tip, plastic tip, and you're just gonna good for bigger fish, you know, the more buoyant so you're gonna foul up less. Um, whereas when you start talking a solid bristle, they're a lot more sensitive, they're good for winter and for small fish, fish which are gonna you know take exception to a bit of resistance. But what it does mean when you're using a solid bristle is you can have a little bit more showing because they're more sensitive. So perhaps if you're getting you know a lot of finicky bites when you're silverfish fishing, you, you can leave a little bit more showing 
Um, so you're only striking when you know a fish has, has got the bait properly and you're not, you know, you're not wasting too much time then striking at silly little line bites or, you know, fish just playing with a bait, which can work really well on some days. Um, other days, you know, it's, they might not barely move that bristle, so you'll have to dot it right down. So that's 1.2 solid. And again, you know, you can use that for F1s with sort of baits like maggots and stuff in the winter as well. I don't tend to use that dotted down though for F1s because I just found a, find a foul hook them. So again, just what I'm talking about then, I'll leave a little bit showing, you know. I'll leave sort of, you know, that much showing or so. And even because they're so sensitive, you know, a fish will still take that under. You can strike at the right time. Now this is a, just to show you another, that's a one mil bristle that is. I think that's fiberglass. It's not something I ever use, to be honest. Bristles this thin are very hard to see, um, you know, especially if you've got like white water. You know, they're very, very sensitive, specialist bristles, so I tend not to touch them. Now, if I could just choose one type of pole float body, it would be this one. It's a generic, slim type of pattern. And these are just brilliant all-around floats for commercial fishing, whether you're fishing for carp or F1s, or silverfish as well, for that matter. And they work so well because they're so slim. And um, i could just show you here. They just settle so well and they sit so well instantly because um, it's not so much the sensitivity of the bite for me, it's the sensitivity of them going through the water and being very easy to uh, to lift and drop and settle very quickly. That's why slim floats are so good. And you can typically, you can fish these with bulks, you know, the, uh, the thicker ones I tend to just fish with a bulk and let the bait fall. And you can also fish them strung out for F1s and silverfish. And they work so well when they're, um, when they're laid horizontally into the water like that. And you're fishing on the drop with strung out shots. And you can just watch the slim body settle and, uh, and go up like that. Or if you're fishing with a bulk and pellets, you can just lower them straight down as I say. And you can get a bite as the bait falls instantly. So this is another good all-around pattern. It's a rugby ball shape. And these are a great choice for fishing on the deck, especially for fish such as skimmers, or if you're fishing for carp and there's a bit of toe or a bit of wind on. And uh, they're quite body down, so they're very stable. Um, typically have long, longer bristles as well, so the float sits a bit lower, the line sits a bit lower even. And uh, they're just great for when there's a bit of uh, bad weather uh, and when a slim float so is going to tend to get moved round in the toe a lot more. Whereas the, the rugby ball is going to stay put a bit better and you can start laying a bit of line on. Uh, you can fish these with kind of bulk shots and maybe one or two droppers. Yeah, good for silverfish and carp these and also for fishing in shallow water like that one. You can fish, you cut, cut down the stems a bit and fish them in shallower water as well. The only problem with these rugby balls is that they sometimes hold up in the surface tension, so they get caught a bit like that because of the, uh, the diameter. Whereas a slim float tends to go straight down, these can hold up a bit, so you do sometimes have to lift them up and check them a bit. So they're not always the best for fishing on the drop, the better when you're sitting there and waiting for a bite. So these are diamond body floats, not something I personally use a lot of, but I know a lot of anglers do. They're uh, mainly a, a deck float for me. Um, I used to use these, these are Mick Wilkinson ones actually. I used to use them a lot of white takers for fishing big baits like meat on a short deep pole line. Because of the body, like the rugby shape, they're very stable. So they're good for, you know, anchoring big baits on the bottom. And what we used to do with these floats a lot is we used to work the meat quite a lot of white acres. So we used to drag the meat along and, um, and it wouldn't ride up. And you sometimes just get a bite like that. And um, I think these have got a big thick cane tip actually. But uh, yeah, a very stable float. You can also use them, uh, these are on shallow rigs as well. Um, short rigs with diamond bodies. A lot of people like them for like slapping and things like that. Personally for that, I just use um, a, a rounded pair body. I think sometimes again with these floats, you do have to check them a bit. They hold up a bit. So you have to lift them and drop them again. But uh, that's a diamond body. Now these are an interesting one, they're called pencil floats. 
got a very thin long body like a pencil and for a specific purpose in my book and that's for very very fast fishing when you're talking a lot of fish mainly small fish so a lot of continentals use these for fish such as bleak uh, especially near the surface you can use them uh, with smaller baits as well on canals and things and the great thing about these is they settle very very quickly um, and instantly so they cut through the water that's why a lot of people like them very shallow as well for dace on the rivers things like that some people used to use these for F1s as well, but they're not really for me. As I say, they're uh, they're not stable as other as of other patterns, and they typically typically come with very uh, fine bristles as well. So more of a uh, especially silverfish float. So these are floats I use a lot. They're called dibbers, as you can see, very short, a kind of fat, slim body and uh, they use mainly for shallow fishing so i'll use them mainly on rigs that are 18 inches deep or less maybe two foot maybe at a push but because they've got thick such thick tips you can't really read them on the drop so you can't tell how uh, how deep the fish are feeding which is why they use for fishing so shallow with and why why they're so short is you want them to as I say, when you put the rig in or slap the rig in or whatever like that, you want them to cock more or less straight away so you can see the bite and the fishing instantly. Especially you might only be fishing, you know, a matter of inches deep. So you only want a short float. You can cut the stems down a bit. As you can see, they've got a big fat bulbous tip, which can be used for bigger baits, pellets, meat as well. Anything over two foot, then I'll start to use something with a bristle that I can read as it goes down. So as it, as it goes down, you'll be able to read the bristle. You know, any, any bites that occur as the shots register, you'll be able to see. And as I say, but these are brilliant on the day. Very, very good. F1s or carp. Some people use scale down dibbers for casters and things like that on canals as well, quite fine cane dibbers, uh, which is interesting. This is a round bodied float that we've got here. As you can see, it's very wide and it's for a specific purpose, really, wherever you've got some deep moving water. So, you know, a river or a deep canal, even. Now, these are the type of floats for running through and also holding back. You know, because of that body, you can hold them back and, um, and and get bites that way. Best really on, as I say, really deeper venues. So we're talking um, big olivets, bulks and a few droppers fishing near the bottom. These are, as I say, no-nonsense floats really, come in quite large sizes and uh, really more... More natural, natural venue fishing, really. Uh, shallower venues with uh, calm conditions. That body is going to be too thick, really. Too much resistance. Um, so it's, it's really for when the water's moving. So these are the main types of float stem. We've got wire, carbon and fiberglass. And each of them has a massive part to play in pole fishing. So first of all, wire. Wire is brilliant when you're fishing on the deck, um, especially when you want to get the bait straight down to the bottom. So you're lowering it in vertically like that. It's going down. And uh, with baits such as pellets, meat, corn, you know, heavier baits where you're going to anchor them to the bottom. Wire is so good because it's heavy. Um, it's going to anchor your bait in place a lot better than wire, carbon or glass and um, those two floats are more susceptible to um, tow and wind. So wire is great for a stable rig with bulk down rigs, you know, a bulk, it's just a bulk or a bulk and one or two droppers. So um, anytime you want to be fishing on the deck, I generally, for bigger fish, you know, for carp and for skimmers and things like that as well, then wire is the one. And for F1s as well on pellets. Now, the only disadvantage with wire is it's very, very bendy and um, they can, if you get a poor quality wire, they can bend and snap or the float can disfigure very, very easily. So if you're fishing near snags and you're definitely going to hook reeds and things like that, then you'd be better off with a glass stem because purely because of the strength that you got, you are going to sacrifice a little bit in stability because uh, glass isn't 
quite as stable as wire in my book, but as I say, the stronger. Now, carbon um, has a very specific purpose for me, and that's for fishing through the water and for silverfish. So carbon stems, the lighter, the stronger, but the lighter. So when you lay that rig in, whereas wire would go like that straight away, carbon tends to uh, rotate a lot more slowly, almost like a clock. So as that's going through the water and you've, you've, your shots are settling, if a bite occurs, you'll see it. Um, a lot, you know, a lot better than you might with wire, and you'd be able to ascertain what depth the fish are taking uh, or biting uh, if, it, if it was well off bottom or just a few inches off bottom, according to what how well the float settled. Now, um, carbon, as I say, it's a bit stronger and lighter, so it's going to be more susceptible to uh, to being moved about. But if you've got a calm day or a shallow swim, that's not going to be so much as an issue. The other thing with carbon is it's the less likely to tangle than wire. So if you're fishing for a lot of fish like, you know, roach and eide, and they really are brilliant. Um, a lot of people use carbon for maggot fishing for F1s. And again, because you're going to be getting bites off the drop, you know, and if, if these fish have come off, off the bottom, then you want to be able to see that and you can pick up a shallow rig. Finally, we've got glass. Now, glass I use on shallow rigs, I'd say. Definitely up in the water on a, a float like that. And also on a what I'd call a mud rig. So any anytime you're fishing in a really shallow mud hole tight to the bank on an island or down the edge, I use, um, I use glass. And I simply use glass because... Um, it's stronger than wire, so if your float's in the net and you're catching a lot of fish, you know, wire stems tend to bend and, you know, you're going to um, destroy rigs and slow you down generally. So um, with, uh, with glass, it's like a hybrid between the carbon and the wire, so uh, it's, a good, it's a good kind of in-between. And uh, you still get a little bit of weight for when you're fishing a shallow rig, it's still going to cock it because it's still quite weighted. You know, I don't like carbon dibbers because you have to check them quite a bit. So for dibbers, I tend to use mainly glass. Again, that's this, that's shallow water. You've got a glass stem. It's, it's, it's stable and it's quite a heavy float that because it's fishing in shallow water and you want a bit of weight to anchor the rig in place when there's a lot of activity and tails and things wafting the rig around. So that, that nice uh, short glass stem is absolutely bob on for a um, you know a rig 18 inch deep or less in summer months. Just want to talk about the side eyes of the float, which are these here, which are the line passes through on its way down the body. Obviously, you attach with silicon further down, and. Uh, now there's two types mainly of side eye. There's there's these which are embedded into the body, often with with quite a length of wire running down there, and there's spring eyes which are kind of wrapped round. Now personally, I would avoid spring eyes. In my book, they they unbalance the flow and they make it a bit top heavy around this area, um, which it just doesn't work for me at all. It doesn't work so well. So. Find, as I say, not everybody makes a great side eye. If you get, you know, cheap or some shop bought patterns, the side eyes can rip out. But if you find a good, you know, handmade float maker like the likes of Malman, which I use a lot, RW, Mick, Wil Mick Wilkinson, those kind of people, they make excellent side eyes that aren't going to rip out, as do a number of um, companies as well commercially these days. Um, so, yeah, definitely for me, just those smaller, more inobtrusive side side eyes. So just a couple of quick tips to end on. First of all, I like to use four rubbers on most of my rigs, especially the uh, the cart rigs and the shallow rigs. And the reason is, first and foremost, they, uh, they stop the float from moving so much. And I don't use too tight uh, a piece of silicon, but as I say, I use four of them so it locks in place and you don't use, lose your depth easily. The second reason is, if you've got a shallow float, like a dibber or a mud float, 
which is going to spend a lot of time in your landing net if you're catching a lot of fish. It's going to take a lot of hammer. So by having four float rubbers on the stem, if one or two break, you're still going to have a, a rig that's fishable. You know, two or three rubbers just isn't enough on those rigs, especially in summer. And, you know, worst case scenario, you're going to have to change rig, put another flow on, lose time. So four rubbers for me is the way to go. Now our second tip is all to do with where you place the silicon on the float stem. So you can see here it's right under the body, tie up there at the base. And all that's going to happen there is, especially with these um, wider, you know, round floats, if you can see that the the line is digging into the body there because of that silicon, and that's going to damage your float. You know, it's going to um, it's going to dig in, cause cuts, and in turn your float is going to take water on as a result of that. Now watch what happens when we just simply move that final bit of silicon halfway down the float. So I've now still got three bits of silicon on, but they're now on the bottom half of the float. Now all of a sudden, that angle of the line is completely widened. And it's now, the, the uh, instead of cutting in down here, it's now coming out and down to the at the middle of the stem. So there's less pressure on the uh, the float body there. So you're going to break less floats, and it's it's just I just prefer to fish like that. So uh, that's just a little quick tip for you there. Hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, you can do that here, please. Or for more videos, try here. Yeah.